Welcome back everyone for today's video we are going to be taking a look at day one of the Chess 9LX event being held here in St. Louis, Missouri. Now for those of you who out there who are unfamiliar with Chess 9LX, Chess 9LX is of course Chess 960 also known as Fisher Random. Now it means that this event is played with the pieces rearranged on the back rank in a completely random order and we play from move one with no knowledge whatsoever. Alright so the event is here in St. Louis there is a $150,000 prize fund. There are many strong players playing, including one of the goats of all time, the famous world chess champion, Gary Kimovich Kasparov. So many players, myself, Fabian, etc., are playing, and let's take a look at the first game of the day. The time control is 20 minutes with a 10 second increment. Players do have the chance to analyze before the games, and let's jump into the action. All right, so I'm playing in the first game of the day with the white piece against my compatriot, Wesley So. Wesley, no, no, uh, no surprise that he has played a lot of Fisher Random in his career. He's somebody who I've played many, many times, both in regular chess, but this variant, and it's definitely going to be about it. So as you'll notice, we have the queen on a1, rook on b1, bishop c1, king d1, knight e1, bishop f1, rook g1, and knight a1. It is an original assortment of the pieces. Obviously, it probably looks a little bit strange to those of you who are watching at home. So I open with the move b3 here, and the idea behind me playing b3 is I want to fianchito the bishop to b2 and immediately put pressure on the long diagonal. Now, one of the drawbacks to playing Fisher Random is that your opponent can oftentimes play a mirror, and Wesley does that himself. So he plays b6. Here I go g4 and now we get the move g5 by wesley when i play g4 one of my big hopes here is that i can bring this knight to g3 and then go to the f5 or the h5 square so wesley goes g5 stopping it of course for both of us our knights on the corner squares are guarded by the rooks on g8 and g1 and now i play bishop b2 wesley goes bishop g7 i trade the bishops and now i play the move knight g3 wesley plays f6 here trying to shut down this long diagonal for the queen and down the road maybe even consider playing the move like e5 so i go e3 wesley plays knight g6 and now i go d4 wesley plays d6 and here i play the move bishop e2 to guard the pawn on the g4 square Wesley goes a5, and now I play the move c4, simply trying to build a bit of a big white center here, and later on deciding where to cast my king. Now, those of you guys who have not watched Fisher Random before, castling might look a little bit foreign to you, but in this position, for example, I can cast my king to the queen side here. I move the king over one, and the rook jumps the other side. Conversely, let's just say I move my knight here, for example. Both of us, likewise, can castle our kings to the king side. So this position is actually very dynamic here because with the ability to castle both kingside and queenside for both players, there's a lot of play. So Wesley goes bishop a6. Here I play the move queen c3. Now my idea behind this move is that I still want to decide which way to castle my king, but also I bring my queen to where it has more squares in the center of the board. So Wesley goes b5, and now I play this move queen takes pawn. Now b5 came as a bit of a shock to me, but I think at this point Wesley felt like he had a lot less space. D's knights are not very active. In fact, the knight on g6 can't go to either the e5 or f4 square. If you ever move a knight to e6, for example, now there's knight to f5 here, and the pawn on e3 actually stops stops black from ever putting a knight on the f4 square so wesley goes b5 i play the move queen takes pawn wesley takes the pawn and now i play the move rook c1 now it's very clear to me that wesley missed this move in the game when i played rook c1 because he started thinking for quite a bit now what i think wesley actually missed after rook c1 is he probably thought well wait what's the big deal i just castle my king out of the center of the board and i'm completely fine but here i can do a temporary queen sack and do a botez gambit i sack the queen with queen takes pawn queen takes bishop on a6 and after queen takes queen i have bishop takes pawn checking the the king and attacking the queen at the same time and after queen takes bishop and rook takes queen if we do the count i have one two one two three four five six seven and wesley is one two three four five six extra pawn in the end game i should win so after rook c1 wesley goes bishop to c8 a very tricky move here i decide to trade the queens and now i take the pawn on c4 now the reason bishop c8 is so tricky is that if i were to take with say the pawn for example i lose the pawn on a2 and now material is balanced and when i take with a bishop attacking the rook now wesley can take the pawn with check i play f3 and after bishop to e6 we have even material here both sides have six pawns on the board the one difference is that i have an outside pass pawn whereas black is a central c pawn 
So here I go a4. Wesley plays move rook to b8, and now I make a very committal decision to play this move d5. Now the reason I play this move is that it was the first round of the event, it's an end game, and I felt like there's very limited risk if I play this d5 move versus playing something like knight to d3, for example, where after takes, takes, let's just say black plays rook to b3, I go, actually not rook b3, I guess king d7 first, um, and then I go like king c2, and after knight h4, rook f1, knight f5 here, black should be completely fine. So I go d5. This way I have a wooden shield, bishop guarding both pawns, access to all the diagonals, and Wesley goes bishop f7. Now I play knight to d3, trying to stop black from jumping to the center. And long term, I'm hoping to start pushing the pawns on the queen side. If I could, I'd love to get a bastion with this knight on the c6 square here, where the pawn supports it. But again, it's very far away as the rook covers the b4 square. Nonetheless, at this point in the game, I thought I might have a very small advantage. And Wesley here makes a mistake when he plays this move c6. Now, what Wesley should have played was the move e6. I think Wesley actually really underestimated position. He thought that after takes, 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 and something like b4, for example, I should be better due to the outside pawn, and black's pawn chains are a little bit split up, versus in this position right here, where currently all the pawns are connected. So, Wesley should have played e6, but instead he plays the move c6 here, and now I take the pawn. Wesley also could have played the move c5, but if he goes c5, I have the option. I can play n peasant with pawn takes pawn, or I can simply ignore it and play a move like rook to a1, for example. So when Wesley goes c6, he's forcing me to take the pawn. If I were to play e4, trying to guard the pawn, now after takes, takes, and king d7, black should be okay here with the knight coming to either e5 or the h4 square. So, I, so in this position, I take the pawn. Wesley trades the juicers, and now he takes the pawn on b3. And here I go for the move king c2. Now, at first glance, I think Wesley actually missed here that he could not sack the rook. With rook takes knight, if I were to take, there's knight to e5, forking the king, the rook, and the pawn, and this other pawn as well. But instead here, I can play the move rook to b1. And in this position, black is actually in all kinds of trouble here because I'm simply threatening to push my p up the board. Sample line, let's say black was king c7, for example. I can play rook to b7 check, king to c8, and here actually I take, and after knight check, here takes, takes. With the two wide peepos here, the a and the c pawns going up the board, this is quite simply a winning position. So, Wesley can't take the knight. Instead, he plays the move rook to b6, and now I play the move a5. Wesley goes rook b5, and here I play the move rook to a1. Now, this move is actually a mistake. I should have played the move rook to b4 here, forcing the exchange of rooks because if black takes a pawn, then you lose the rook with rook to b8 check, and after king c7 and rook g8, white has an extra tower, and it's gg, why not? So I should have played rook before, but I actually thought during the game after takes and king c7, I thought black was okay here, but after knight to e4, apparently black is not okay because if you play with like knight to e5, forking the two pawns here. Now I have knight to d5, checking the king. If you take, then there's a fork. And if you play a move like, let's just say, uh, rook to a8, for example, now I can go rook to a1. And the reason this is so bad for black is now if you go knight to e5, I can play knight to c3. Knight is jumping to either b5 or d5, very similar to the game, actually. And if black were to take, I can go check. If you go king b7, I have a6 check, and d's knights hold each other. King can't come forward. King has to go away. You lose the horse, and you lose the game. And if black was king d7, then I have knight to b6, forking the king and the rook here, and black will lose a lot of material as well. So, I should have played rook to b4, but instead I go for the move rook to a1, putting the rook behind the pass pawn and intending to push some p up the board. Wesley goes king c7, I play knight to e2 here, and the idea is that I want to reroute my knight to either the d4 or the c3 square, attacking this rook on b5. So, Wesley goes knight to f5, here I go king to d2, guarding the pawn, and now Wesley plays this move rook d5, and this is simply a big mistake. Now, you will notice here that I'm way up on the clock, I'm up almost six minutes here, and I think that because of the time situation, Wesley starts to panic, and he makes a big mistake here. What Wesley should have played was a move knight to e5, forking the knight, the pawn, and the rook, and after knight takes, black can take with the d-pawn, opening up the d-file for the towers, and after knight c3, rook d8, king c1, and rook b3, it's a very very, very messy position. Apparently after rook c5, knight takes e3 and rook a2. White is better because of threats like knight b5 or a6, a7. But who knows if I would have been able to find this move. So instead, Wesley plays move rook d5, and now I'm able to play the move e4, forking the rook and the knight, and Wesley plays knight e5. Wesley could have sacked the rook with rook takes knight here, but after takes, knight to e5, king c3, knight takes c4, king takes c4. Black is in all kinds of trouble after a sample line like knight to e3. 
I go king d3, knight g2, and now I have a very nasty move, knight to d4, guarding the pawn here. And let's just say black were to play e5. Probably think, well, black's going to win the pawn on c6, so the knight's got to go since it's under attack. But in fact, after knight to f5 here, black cannot take the pawn because of knight e7, forking the king and the rook. And after a move like rook to a8, I can simply go king c4, king c6, and after check, king d7 and knight d5. Even though black has an extra pawn on the king side here, I've got this outside pass pawn. I've got a great bash in here, all kinds of four threats, and I should win the game. So Wesley goes knight e5. Here I take the rook, he takes, and now I go for the move king c3. Now what you'll notice is now I have two connected pawns here, the pass pawn on c6 supported by the pawn on d5, but I also have the a pawn that I want to push up the board as well. So Wesley goes knight e5 back, and now I play the move f4 here. Now, this move is not necessary. Rook to b1 would have been good enough, but I play f4 because what I'm hoping for is that if Wesley trades the horses here after g4, knight c3, I have knight b5, and I'm pushing the white peepos up the board, I'll win the game in short order. If black were to take, I can take, and now I've got a juicy bash on square for the horse on e6, winning the game as well. So Wesley goes knight to f3. Here I play the move knight b4, and now Wesley plays rook a8. Only move, by the way, because if black were to take, I can go check, king d8, and then rook to b1, followed by rook to b8. Black can move the king to avoid checkmate, but after check, king f7, takes, takes, and c7. I'm pushing my p, I'm getting a queen, and I'm winning the game. So Wesley goes rook a8. Here I play the move king d3, and now you start to see the power of these knights as they head towards the queen side here. At this point, black is simply lost because knight c3, knight b5 is too powerful and cannot be stopped. So Wesley plays g4, I go knight c3, and now he plays the move knight takes h2. Maybe knight, knight 3 to d4 is still hanging on by a thread because there's no knight b5, but after king to e4, for example, the knights are really stuck here. You can't move one of the knights without losing the other one, and for that reason, after, say, I move like h5, now I can just start waiting, rook a2, h4, and knight c2 here, followed by knight b5, and I should be winning the game. So Wesley takes the pawn out of desperation. I go knight b5, king c8, and now I push a6. Wesley goes g goes h5, and here I play the move a7. If Wesley were to play g3, by the way, it's the same thing. I still go a7 anyway. And after g2 here, I can simply play, the, play a move like uh, king to e2, winning this pawn on f2 with king f2, and king takes pawn. So Wesley goes h5. Now I play a7, g3, knight to a6, and Wesley goes for g2. Now, unfortunately for Wesley, it's too little too late because after rook to b1, now I have a very nasty checkmate threat. Let's say black were to queen the pawn, for example. I can sack the knight with knight takes pawn. If you take with a knight, I go rook to b8 check. Knight covers this critical square. King can't move forward, and after takes, I underpromote to a rook, and this is checkmate. If black goes king to d8, I still have rook to b8 check. And after takes, I can still take under promoting to a rook. And again, the king has no escape squares on c7 or d7. And the game ends immediately. So Wesley plays king to d8 here. And now I play the move knight bc7. Knight takes d6 is actually still probably winning. But after pawn takes knight, suddenly here, if I check, the king has an escape square on e7. And black survives in the position. So I play knight bc7 instead, and here Wesley resigns because now, again, the idea of rook b8 is checkmate. Let's say black were to queen. After rook to b8 here, takes, takes, same thing, checkmate, black loses. And if black goes rook c8, I have rook to b8 here. And the main point is the king cannot get away to the king side as these knights cover all the squares. So if I get rook b8, let's just say black were to queen, I trade. Again, I can promote to a rook, and the game ends. So after knight bc7, Wesley so resigns this game, and I get a very nice victory in the first round of the event. Now, obviously, I've played Wesley many times, but I have to say in Fisher Random, I do consider this to be one of my better wins against him. It's a very beautiful win. Feels like it was very smooth from the middle game to the end game, and I kept it very straightforward and clean. All right, so I get off to a great start with a win in the first game, and now let's jump to the second game where I'm once again playing with white pieces against Levon Aronian. Now, Levon is no stranger to 960 either. I've played it many times. In fact, I beat him, I believe, in the 2008 Fisher Random World Championships, eight or nine, I could be wrong, but I think it was 2008 in Mainz, Germany. We played a big match. I beat him there to get the title for the first time. I would also point out I am currently the Fisher Random World Champion, having won the title in 2022 in the World Championship in Reykjavik, Iceland. So, playing Levon with the white pieces, again, another assortment of 
random piece on the back rank and I open with the move F4. Now the reason I open with F4 is very simple. I'm looking at this bishop on E1 and unlike in normal chess, the diagonals are not as clear cut. So let's let's just set up a random position with the bishop. Uh, I guess I'll make some random moves just to illustrate the point. If you, if you start with the bishops on C1 and C8, for example, it's very clear cut which diagonal the bishop is going to. It's either gonna go to a square like G5, F4, or you can go for a fianchito with B3 and bishop B2. But it's very straightforward. Obviously, devs who created chess, they fundamentally understood where the pieces belong. So if you have bishop on C1, it's very clear cut. Whereas in this game, with a bishop on E1, let's just say you play D3, G6, you don't really wanna to go to C3. B4 doesn't really threaten anything, and black can go D6, C5. A5 just looks silly because of B6 here. So where do you develop this dark square B? Now, on top of that, you have to look at the light square B2. And one of the moves that I think is actually a big mistake here is to play the move E4, because after black plays a move like F5, let's just say you take, and we get position like G3 and G5, for example, Black's Bs are very, very active on both the diagonals, whereas I still have this bum B on E1 that is simply not in the game. So that's why I play the move F4 instead, because after F5 and G3, I have a very simple setup. I want to put my bishop on F2 here, and then both of the Bs on the two diagonals are supremely well placed to target the pawns on B7 and A7. So we get G6 from Levon. I play bishop F2, knight B6, important move. Let's say black were to play E5. I can simply take the juicer on A7, and it's uh-oh spaghetti -o time. The rook on B8 is trapped. I'll win the rook, and black will lose the game. So, what, so Levon plays knight to b6 here, not Wesley, of course. I play the move e4, we get takes, takes, and now Levon plays e5, trying to strike in the center. I trade the pawns, and here I play the move rookie one. Now, up to this point, this is all preparation. Prior to the game, the players are given about 10 minutes to analyze the position. And before this game, this was the suggestion of Gary Kimovich Kasparov, the famous world 13th world champion. He mentioned the move rook to e1. I would also point out that I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity to analyze with Gary, one of the two goats all time in chess. And it's really a pleasure and, uh, and an honor to have such a chance. And Gary showing once again why he is so good, because rookie one, I believe, is the best best move according to the computer Gary Chess there's a reason he's got that moniker it's because he is simply a goat so I play rookie one Levon goes d6 here pushing the pawn to guard the bishop and trying to develop his light square b on this diagonal rather than putting the bishop on this f7 square so Levon has an idea to develop the b to the other diagonal this is simply a little bit dubious because now I go knight to f3 attacking the bishop Levon moves the bishop back and now I play the move queen h3 now if Levon were to play bishop g7 this could already be very scary because I have knight to g5 here I'm threatening to go for a big family fork with knight to e6 forking the queen the bishop the rook and the pawn all at the same time and if black plays a move like bishop d7 to stop the fork then i can eat the pawn on h7 and at least i'm up in material so Levon goes to f6 to stop all these knight g5 ideas he doesn't want to get forked and now i play queen h3 checking the king on c8 but attacking the pawn on h7 and creating the classic 90 degree right triangle Levon goes bishop d7. He maybe could have played rook d7, but after knight b3, this rook looks a little bit awkward. Let's just say black castles. Now there might even be knight d4, knight e6, there's knight a5, and these knights in the middle of the board are very, very active. So Levon goes to f6, I check, he goes bishop d7, I take the pawn on h7, and now we get the move knight e7. Here I play the move bishop to e3, and this is a move the computer actually doesn't like. It would have preferred to ignore everything with either castling long or playing the move c3, but at the end of the day, I am still only human, and with this queen on h7 that actually has no squares currently available, the last thing that I want to do is get my queen trapped by accident and lose the game very prematurely. So, or prematurely, I should say. After knight to e7, I play this move bishop to e3, creating an escape square for the queen on h6, or playing bishop h6 as well. Levon plays knight c4, I go bishop h6, we get queen h8, I trade, and now I go bishop f4. Now, one thing that I think I did very well in these first two games specifically is keeping it very simple, trading pieces, trying to play logically, and not being too creative. Because at this point, I'm simply up upon an end game with basically no risk of losing. So Levon decides to castle, I play the move h4 here, getting rid of a weakness because one of the dangers is that down the road, black could maybe go for something like g5 or even d5 and bishop g4. And all these, all these issues on the king side start to rear their head. So 
I play the move h4, stopping g5. Now I've got the bishop and the pawns guarding each other, and Levon plays d5. I go bishop d3, we get bishop g4, and here I play the move knight h2. Levon goes bishop f5, and now I make a mistake when I decide to trade the bishops. Now the computer actually wants to play the move knight to b3 here, allowing black to double my juicers on the d file, but apparently after knight d6 and knight g4, I'm simply winning due to the bishop and the knight being completely overloaded in the position. So I should have played knight b3. Instead, I play the very natural move, trading the b's, and now going c3. Now, the reason I play c3 is that I would love to castle, but then I hang the pawn on b2, and I'm in a lot of trouble. Whereas after c3, I kill the threats on the diagonal, and now I have the option to either scoot the king forward to c2 or still go for this move with castling on the queen side. So Vaughn plays rook e8. Here I go, rook takes rook, takes, and king c2. And as you'll notice, I've kind of squandered the advantage, but I'm still up a pawn, and it's going to require some precise play from Levon to avoid losing the game. So he plays rook e2. I go knight to g4, bishop e7, and now I play the move knight to b3, bringing this knight into the game and guarding the pawn on d2. Levon plays rook g2, and now I play the move rook to e1, attacking the bishop on e7. And here Levon makes a howler of a blunder with this move b6, where he simply sees the boogeyman and pan panics. Now, I think what Levon intended to do initially was to take on h4, but after bishop h4, I think he got scared of knight c5, because if you take the pawn, now there's rook to e8, checkmate, king is stuck on c8, no squares to go to, and you lose the game. Or he thought I could take and then again go knight c5, threatening the mate. And after saying knight to d6, maybe he thought bishop g5, rook f1, there's some tricks in the position. However, there are no tricks because if I were to play the move knight c5, Levon can simply retreat the bishop, knight guards the bishop, bishop targets the knight. And then once I move my knight to, I don't know, let's just say b3 back, now black can go g5. There are no mate threats. King is very, very secure here. It can always run to the center of the board and I probably will lose the game. So the best line is probably to take, go here, knight d6, and then simply take. And now after pawn takes, rook to e8, king c7, and knight d3, rook h4, and rook f8, probably the game will end in a draw. I'm temporarily down a pawn, but I have rook f7, creating the kebab on the seventh rank. I have knight b4 to hit the pawn on d5, and probably black will have to give back some material to save the game, but black should not lose. Instead, Levon plays b6, which is also a very logical move. It stops my knight from jumping to either a5 or c5. The pawn dominates the horse, but there is a massive drawback to this move, as I can now play the move knight to h6. And here, black actually has huge problems, because now the knight is under attack, the rook targets the bishop, and suddenly black's position is collapsing. Keep in mind, black is still down a pawn. Now, if Levon were to take the knight here, I have rook takes bishop, creating the kebab, bishop targets the knight, I take on c7, I take on a7, and at this point, I'm simply up two pawns, two or three pawns rather, in this position in an end game, and I will win very, very easily. If so, instead, Levon plays the move bishop d6, but now I'm able to trade the knights on f5, and after rook to h1, I have a rook behind to pass pawn once again. I'm still up a pawn on the king side, and I'm starting to push my p up the board. Now, I did use a lot of time reaching this moment in the game, but the good thing for me is that at this point, after knight h6, all my moves become very straightforward and easy, and I don't have to spend any time. So, we reach this position after rook h1, Levon trades, he goes knight to e3, king c1, and now he plays move knight g4. Now, this is imp it is imperative that when your opponent has a pass pawn with a rook behind it, you gotta stop the pawn. And if black doesn't play knight e3 here, so you go knight d6, h5, knight f7, now the pawn is getting way, 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 way up the board. And at this point, I'm simply winning, rook guards the pawn, knight hits the pawn in f5, and black can already resign. So we get knight e3 and knight g4 here. Idea is that now if I go h5, black can blockade with the horse on h6, stops the pawn, but it also guards the pawn on f5 as well. So here I play knight d4. Levon goes knight f2. I play rook f1. Only move if I were to go rook e1. There's knight d3 forking the king, the rook, and the pawns at the same time. So I play rook f1. Levon plays king d7. And here I decide to take the pawn. Levon goes knight e4. And now I play the move rook h1 back, putting the rook behind the pass pawn once again. Now there are shades of the first game that I played of the day as well, where it's like a rook behind a pass pawn in the end game. Remember that concept, because in many cases that will be very, very effective. So Levon plays king e6. I play knight d4, king f7, h5. And here Levon plays move king g8. Now, Levon is obviously down to his last 12 seconds here. He's simply moving quickly. And this move makes a lot of sense because now at least he can block this h-pawn with the king in front of it. 
So I go knight f3. Levon plays knight g3, and here I play the move rook h4. This is still probably pretty good for me, but knight to e1 would have been a better move here because if black takes on h1, I'm still up two pawns in a knight and pawn endgame. And if you go rook to e2, now I have rook to g1, winning the knight on g3. Instead, I play rook h4. Levon goes knight f5. I play rook h3, and here we get the move rook g4. Now I play the move h6. We get takes, h7, king h8, and here I go knight to e5, threatening to fork the king and the rook with knight g6, or play a move like, or sorry, I meant here, or play a move like knight f7, pushing my p and getting a queen. So Levon goes knight e7, knight covers g6, rook covers f7, and temporarily black is hanging on. But after rook to h6, black is in fact in Zugzvang. Meaning, if black were to play rook f5 and I go d4, for example, here black cannot break the threats. If you check, I bring start walking the king to the queen side. If you ever move the rook away, there's knight f7. If you ever move the knight away, for example, there's always knight g6. So both the knight and the rook are glued. Knight is glued covering g6, rook is glued covering f7. So I can simply start walking my king up the queen side and black will lose eventually. So here Levon plays move d4, and now I play the move king c2. It's important I play this move and not rook e6 right away, because if I go rook e6, now black can check, and then move the knight to f5, for example, and he's threatening to capture the pawn on h7. Now, very important to note, because when I go king c2 and we get pawn takes pawn, here I do in fact play the move rook e6, and now Levon resigns because there's no longer a rook f1 check. Now, that's part of the reason he resigns. The other reason is that you can't really move the knight, because after knight d5, I go knight g6 check, forking the king and the rook, and after takes, 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 rook e7, and rook to c7, let's just say takes and rook a7 here, I have a 2v1 on the queen side, I'm going to win the pawn on d2. Rook and two pawns versus a knight and one will be a very elementary win. And if black does not move the knight, for example, there's not much else you can do. Say you take the pawn on b2. I take the knight on e7 here, and now I'm actually threatening knight to g6 checkmate. Say you go rook f1, knight g6 is gg on the spot. And if you go rook f6, I can simply take the pawn on b2. And with the knight and the rook on, on these squares, this is also completely winning. So after rook to e6, Levon, Levon chooses, actually I'll, one last line I'll show, which is you have knight f5 here, check knight d4, and black does get a fork with knight d4 hitting the rook and king, but after takes, 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 I have an extra horse and I win as well, which is why after rook e6, Levon Aronian resigns this game and I got get off to a very red hot start with 2-0. and oh. Now in the third game, I would play the black piece against Fabiano Caruana, who is also on two out of two, and I got a little bit too creative in the opening of that game. I kind of lost some of the simplicity that I showed in these first couple of games and I got soundly outplayed and destroyed in a game where I objectively had no realistic chance of winning so I didn't really end the day the way I would have liked to but nonetheless with two wins and one loss I'm currently tied for second place in the chess 9lx event being held here in St. Louis Missouri um, and thus far I'm enjoying it so even if you're not the biggest fan of fish or random chess uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and if you're not subscribed to my channel make sure that you smash that subscribe button below um, and I'll be back soon with some more great recaps and once again let me know in the comments if the volume is okay and all these other things I'm obviously on the road but I'm trying to do my best for you guys the fans who are out there watching have a great rest of your day and I'll see you soon bye